From Istanbul, welcome to Showcase. Today on the show, we're joined by a group of French and Germans with a Russian name who are shaking up the jazz world. I'll speak to the Tarkovsky Quartet. We'll also preview the latest offering from the Coen brothers and we're going to France to check out a retrospective of Japanese artist Sugimoto Hiroshi. But first... An ancient trade route turns into an artistic collaboration. And we'll see how the death of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi has rocked the world of art. Two artists, two different techniques and two regions. A Turkish artist creates marble scrolls and a Chinese calligrapher inscribes them with passages from the Quran. They called this collaboration the New Silk Road, hinting at the old trade route. The artists presented their work with an exhibition at Istanbul's Nev Mekan complex and showcases Nursana Tutar got this glimpse of the gallery. After hundreds of years, Istanbul becomes a part of the Silk Road again, though this time the purpose is art, not business. Turkish Ebru artist Hikmet Borucugil and Chinese calligrapher Haji Nordin Mi Guangzhan have put together a collaborative exhibition called Silk Road. Traditionally, all 137 artwork on display here are written in Arabic letters, and they mostly quote the Quran. So I analyzed the paper really well before deciding what to write on it. That was one of the longest processes of making these artworks, to study the surface and decide on a script that went with the general theme of the marbling. In China, calligraphy is not just art, it's a spiritual practice. After praying, the artist spends hours staring at the paper before actually picking up the brush. And once you do, it's said that calligraphy is less writing and more of a rhythmic dance. So the process of art making became a serious ritual for the two. The fact that I used the Chinese brushes for these works, the rhythmic moves of the brush felt as I was wandering on a road, to us, that was the new Silk Road. To non-Mandarin speakers, some of these characters might look Chinese, even though they're Arabic using a Chinese style. But amazing enough, they still can be understood in both languages. Art doesn't speak one language, nor does it belong to one religion or nation. Art doesn't care about your skin color or nationality. Art is about beauty and sharing that beauty with the world. The Silk Road exhibition will continue to connect continents until the 31st of October. Nursan Atutar, TRT World, Istanbul. The mysterious death of a Saudi journalist, Jamal Khashoggi, has been a political and diplomatic firestorm over the past three weeks. But the journalist's death and unknown whereabouts has also had a huge impact on the art world. Columbia University cancelled an event with Saudi artist Ahmed Matar, who has ties with Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and was helping to organize the New York Arab World Arts and Education Program. In addition to that, major cultural institutions in New York, including the Met and the Brooklyn Museum, announced their decision to block any donations coming from the kingdom. For more on the art scene's response to Khashoggi's death, I'm joined by Tier 2 World's editor-at-large, Craig Kapitas. Thank you so much for being with us, Craig. Hey. Now, we're so used to having you on Tier 2 World talk about, talking about money. You're the money guy. Um, but little do people know that you've had a background in arts and culture as well. And you're the perfect person to ask <laughs> how 
uh, Khashoggi's death is affecting the art world? Well, I think there's two ways you have to look at it. First of all, the big cultural institutions in the United States and elsewhere were feeding at the Saudi trough for many years, taking their money, in essence trying to promote the Saudi myth. And this is the big inconvenient truth. Now that is over. The problem that Saudi Arabia has now is Saudi Vision 2030. Because the money that Saudi needed to attract to put its young people to work needed to go to young people who were interested in the arts. That kind of money did not come from McKinsey or from Total or from a big oil company. It came from entrepreneurial ventures, whether they be in Silicon Valley or Hollywood. That money is now gone. And how much how much of it is gone now, or how many people have pulled back after this well, uh, incident took place? What we know is all of Silicon Valley has pulled back. The deals with Hollywood, those are gone. And this was, these were very, very important deals. You can't underestimate them. Some, some quick, you know, business, I've got to give you some statistics, and this really will illustrate. 70% um, of the adult population in Saudi Arabia works for the government. That means they're bureaucrats. They don't contribute anything. The Saudi Ministry of Labor says that 1.2 million jobs must be created by 2022 just to reverse the official unemployment rate of 12%, it's likely higher, down to an equally woeful 9%. When you start looking at young people out of work, the figures go way up. And when the consulting firms came in, for the Saudi government to find out what new sectors can we open up for young people. Well, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that McKinsey realized that the arts was a place that a lot of young people would like to try their hand at. Now that's gone. Well, tell me about it, uh, vice versa. How, uh, how much has the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia contributed to the art world? Well, they paid $450 million for Da Vinci's Salvador Mundi. Now we don't know where it is. It was supposedly gifted to uh, the Emirates. I think it was, uh, um, yeah, it was gifted to the Emirates. Uh, they buy a lot of art. They invest a lot of art. Well, they have a lot of petrochemical dollars. So they, they were able to make these investments and get close not only to museums and cultural institutions, but also universities who also enjoyed their largesse, the Saudi largesse. And again, this was part of this larger inconvenient truth that no one wanted to mention at polite cocktail parties because the money was flowing. And now Jamal Khashoggi assassinated here in Istanbul, apparently inside <coughs> the Saudi consulate, which is just a few miles up the road from where mm -hmm. we're sitting, this has changed the game plan, 100%. And do you think it's going to stay like this? Or do you <clears> think, you know, uh, relations over time will heal between Saudi Arabia and the art world? If you look at the art world as an economic engine, which I do, that entrepreneurs from the art world, whether they be in dance or film or music or digital, Saudi Arabia needed those experts from outside to come in and help recreate the Saudi economy for young people. The only things people know how to do in Saudi Arabia are be bureaucrats and petrochemical engineers. They have no management experience or skills in any of these other areas. So now, because of this assassination, the arts world, which is by definition liberal and concerned about these issues, they don't want the blood money. Mm -hmm. Now, real quick, um, Craig, <coughs> do you think that any institution or a certain individual will, will receive backlash um, from Saudi Arabia uh, at all after all these uh, actions have been taken towards them? No, not on the larger legacy uh, business deals that go on between uh, Saudi Arabia and the West. Arms, petrochemicals, there's too much money involved. That has to keep going. Uh, that's not cynical, that's real politique. Mm -hmm. That's a strategic decision. But again, this is really so important. That was never the raison d'etre for Saudi Vision 2030. Mm -hmm. Saudi Vision 2030 
needed young American and Western entrepreneurs to come into the kingdom and help develop what we can largely call an arts industry. Mm -hmm. Those people are no Great longer Great jobs coming. for the younger generation. It, and exactly. And even the McKinsey reports and the other reports that were done by the consulting firms, they pointed out, if you're a 20, unemployed 20-something 20 in Saudi Arabia, any 20-year-old, they're going to be interested in the arts, right? Whether it's music, film, or whatever. Of course. Those opportunities are now gone. Unfortunately. Well, yes. Craig Kapitas, thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today to speak about um, Khashoggi's involvement in the art world and the impact it's had on the art world. Still to come on Showcase. This Japanese artist threw a ghost party at the Palace of Versailles. So I'm the distractor with a little story. The Cohen brothers explore the open frontier like never before. I suppose. and how this modern jazz group is getting inspiration from an old Soviet director. And now for a quick look at some other stories from the world of the arts and culture. Thousands have said farewell to Turkey's renowned photojournalist and artist Aragulaj, who died from heart failure at the age of 90. The funeral was held in Istanbul's Galatasaray Square, near the street that was named after him. Dubbed the Eye of Istanbul, Gülar was known for his black and white portraits of the city. The skull of a 12,000-year-old fossil nicknamed Luzia has been recovered from the wreckage of Brazil's National Museum. A fire ravaged the building, destroying almost all of its artifacts. The museum's director announced that 80% of the fragments from Luisia's skull have been identified and are confident the rest can be recovered and reassembled. Oscar-winning actor Jeffrey Rush goes to court in a defamation trial against Australian newspaper The Daily Telegraph. Rush is suing over articles claiming that he sexually harassed actor Aaron Jean Norville. Russia's lawyers say there's no evidence to back the accusations and that the newspaper was looking for the next Weinstein scandal. And Auction House Arts Curiel is selling several works by Banksy. But after a stunt earlier this month that saw the artist's Girl with Balloon painting shred to pieces, Arts Curiel said it would actually welcome another surprise. Girl with Balloon sold for $1.4 million at Sotheby's London, and art collectors are paying extra attention to his upcoming sale. The Coen brothers first shook the film world back in 1984 with their low-budget debut set in Deep South USA. Along the way, they helped pioneer the independent film movement, and since then, the siblings have been praised to the moon and have won all the big awards the movie industry could offer, including multiple Oscars and Golden Globes. But recent years saw the veteran director duo becoming the target of fans who claim their output have become lightweight compared to their initial powerhouse offerings. Could things change with their latest Western, The Ballad of Buster's Scruggs? Let's try and find the answer. I'm Buster. Buster Scruggs. Machine iron work. Almost a decade after their BAFTA winning Western drama True Grit, the movie making team of Joel and Ethan Cohen return to the wild frontier once again with the ballad of Buster Scruggs. But this time, the quirky directing duo go back to their roots by bringing an epic scale examination of the country through their sardonic humor. It's a kind of like going west story. Uh, I get to be with the wonderful Bill Heck and Granger Hines, um, both of whom were like perfect playmates. Um, I can't tell you anything more. I think I don't know. I don't know what I'm authorized to say. So I'm the distractor with a little story. Liam Neeson, who plays one of the ensemble piece's many leads, says their film will deliver all the goods expected from a Coen Brothers feature. 
they're, they're just very unique storytellers. Uh, all their films have a wonderful quirkiness to them, real humanity, and just an edge of uncomfortableness that I kind of like, you know? They're, uh, they're quite unique. Upon its Venice Festival debut, the film received good word of mouth, and fans had to wait a long time for the actual release of The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. The satirical motion picture will soon have its premiere on the internet, a decision made by producers Netflix that caused great controversy within the movie community. I will just have to see you. The Palace of Versailles is both grand in pedigree and in size. At an expense of more than 8 million square meters, you can fit some pretty big art projects there. But Japanese photographer and architect Sugimoto Hiroshi sees it a different way. When given the opportunity to exhibit his work, he decided to go with a method that some might think is a waste of space. A historic complex of castles and palaces, a symbol of French glory. The Palace of Versailles is hosting an exhibition of the multidisciplinary conceptual artist Sugimoto Hiroshi. As he shows off his glass tea house, Sugimoto says he took a different approach compared to artists that had previously displayed their works here. The people try to make a huge scale uh, art, they try to fit into this space, but uh, I decided not to do that. Instead, I want to present the smallest size scale of the art. We fit it into this grand scale of Versailles. So here we are, we have only like a two meter square cube to be uh, floating on one of the pond. So it's, uh, it makes, it brings the people's attention to the small point into the huge scale. Each palace hosts faces from the past, but most of his carefully posed subjects were dead long before the age of photography. My photography is uh, the vehicle of the, the history to be a think backwards, not, not forwards. So I decided to bring all my previously photographed wax portrait figure who has a record of visiting Versailles. Let's, let's bring them back together to have a party. So this is uh, the, the spirit, party of the spirits of the, the Versailles. And the list is long. From Queen Elizabeth and Princess Diana, to King Louis XIV, who lived here before the revolution of 1789, forced him and his wife, Marie Antoinette, to flee to Paris. I think that Sugimoto is fascinated by the revolution. So he presented personalities of the revolution and others that visited Versailles afterwards, those phantoms of the past. He also added an extraordinary sculpture named the surface of the revolution that assembles several revolutions, like the one of mathematics, the French Revolution, and the Cosmic Revolution. The palaces of Versailles, which symbolize power and beauty, are already a popular spot for tourists. But now, they take on even more intriguing air thanks to the addition of Sugimoto's unique pieces. The Akbank Jazz Festival is in full swing here in Istanbul. More than 100 musicians are performing from across Turkey and around the world. Among them is Tarkovsky Quartet. The four musicians may be German and French, but they first came together in 2006 to pay tribute to the famous Soviet film director Andrei Tarkovsky. Their music has been described as startling and stark, modern and baroque. Two of the four members of the band join me in our studio today. Pianist and composer Francois Couturier and cellist Anja Lechner. Thank you so much for being with us today on Showcase. Francois, let me start off with you. How did you come up with the idea of being inspired by filmmaker Andre and then later on creating a group of musicians that uh, create music essentially inspired by his films? Yes. Uh, 15 years ago, uh, I had a project uh, to, to do uh, a CD with uh, the prestigious label uh, OCM, and uh, I decided to, 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 uh, to, to, to do an, 
an homage to a tribute to Andrei Tarkovsky because for me he's the, the greatest uh, filmmaker and I saw all the films I like very much. Uh, and I created this quartet and we did a, re a record named uh, Nostalgia, Song for Tarkovsky. Nostalgia is a, fi a film from uh, Andrei Tarkovsky. Mm -hmm. It was a personal uh, uh, homage to, 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 to the cineast, but little by little we, be, be, we became a real group and uh, we, the name Tarkovsky is, is Tarkovsky Quartet now, but we, less, less and less we use uh, the Tarkovsky film. <laughs> Of mm -hmm. course. <laughs> so he's the main inspiration yes. uh, of the fundamentals that this group was kind yes. of built on. Um, now, Anya, let me cross over to you. Do you think that you could picture the music that's essentially composed um, by your group in, in, in one of his movies, in Andrei's movies? Uh, Tarkovsky was uh, famous for not using music, yes. nearly using no music, um, but maybe from the atmosphere. It's, it's the atmosphere, it's the, um, the world of, of dreams which uh, inspires us and our music. And by the way, not uh, a big part of our project is not composed, it's just freely improvised. Wow. Yeah. Um, because uh, Francois is an improviser and um, Jean-Louis Matinier as well. Jean-Marc Larcher comes from the classical music and me too. So that's how we, we meet. Uh, it's a mixture between composition and... So tell me, tell and me a bit about that process. How, yeah. how do you create your music? If you don't compose it, you just come together and improvise? Is no, that we how also it works? Compose. Francois yes, I compose, compose pieces. I compose uh, some pieces uh, and, and we play some uh, Baroque music, some uh, piece of Vivaldi, but the, it's, uh, the, the first uh, thing very important is uh, the orchestration is very, is, uh, very special with accordion, saxophone, piano and uh, cello. And uh, the sound is very... Uh, unique and uh, when we play uh, Vivaldi is not a baroque music because it's the sound of, of our group and the second thing it's uh, the improvisation is very very important because uh, in the studio for the CD and in on stage we have a lot of improvisation we didn't decide anything we play we create in the instant uh, the, the music Wow, being spontaneous is key then yes. when yes. it comes to the... We are in a jazz festival. Yes. <laughs> of course. Yes. So we, the, the, the relationship, the, the relation with the jazz is the, really the improvisation. Mm -hmm. yes. Now, um, let me touch upon something that uh, was on my mind today, actually. I was born in the 1990s, um, and Andrei Tarkovsky's movies date... Uh, far back uh, to my generation. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the younger generation somewhat might not be able to connect mm -hmm. with um, his concept and his films and essentially your music because that's what you guys have been inspired by. Um, in what ways do you attract the younger generation? Um, music is always music. <laughs> So even if we are inspired by Tarkovsky, but not only, because this is now our third program, yeah. and we, we just picked uh, tunes which we like, which are maybe not connected to Tarkovsky at all. Uh, so that means you don't need uh, to know the, the movies, but if you know them, maybe even better. But music should always be music, and you should so, open your ears in order to listen to it. Music is always music. Speaking about music, uh, I'm going to have to end this here, but uh, we do have a clip of your song Nuit Blanche uh, that we will be sharing with our viewers. Now we're about to wrap up this edition of Showcase with me, Efnan Han. Don't forget to check out our YouTube channel for more stories on the global art scene. Mm -hmm.